Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last round of our Art and Focus virtual series for fall 2022. Hard to believe we are almost going to be in, in 2023. Uh, you're seeing on screen the subject of today's Art and Focus, which is this plaster cast after Michelangelo's P.T. Tondo, the original of which is in the Bargello in Florence. For those of you who have been on campus or have visited the website for our press exhibition, you might have seen this last time we did the virtual art and focus. I showed the same uh, entering shot into the gallery. We've had this exhibition out of the Crest Vaults, Women in Sacred Renaissance Painting, up since September. And it is hard to believe that the show is already at its end. It will close this Saturday. So if you're local, you have until Saturday at four o'clock to visit this exhibition, the first one ever to have been co-curated by Fairfield students. And if you step inside, I mean, you might recognize the Doso Dossi from our last round direct ahead of us. But if you went down the stairs and turned to your right, you would see in the corner uh, what I sort of, yeah, what's the word, informally refer to as our, our Michelangelo corner. So the plaster cast hanging on the wall and dead ahead is a painting that we borrowed from the Crest Foundation in New York. This is a... Um, a painting of the Virgin reading with little St. John the Baptist and Jesus behind her. And it's assigned to an unknown follower of Michelangelo, who might have been a guy named Piero d'Argento. Uh, but it is assigned to a follower of Michelangelo because art historians believe that the sculptor, who did not enjoy painting, provided a drawing for the figure of the Virgin Mary to one of his many assistants or associates. So it was on the basis of that connection that we knew we were borrowing this painting from the Crest Foundation that had this connection to Michelangelo, that we decided to include a plaster cast that is from the museum's own collection. So I've joked to people entering the Bellarmine Hall galleries that the show is called Women in Sacred Renaissance Painting, and one of these things is not like the rest. So the justification for including that plaster cast, as I've just mentioned, is that sort of Michelangelo connection. And also it's a fantastic object, and it is one that it has not been in our galleries in a long time, so we welcome the opportunity to bring it back. If you visited Fairfield, um, either before the show opened or indeed next semester, and you went into the new Egan School of Nursing and you went into the Canarec Center for Palliative Care, you would find this plaster cast on a wall there in one of the classrooms. So we have had it on long-term loan, let's say, to the nursing school, uh, and that is the environment in which it currently lives. And in preparation for this art and focus, it's been interesting for me to reflect on how differences in environment, in ambient color and ambient light can affect our interaction with an art object. And indeed, even the height level at which something is hung is a little bit higher in the nursing school than it is in our galleries right now, partially to keep it out of the way of backpacks being sort of brushed against it. But this is the, the reference photo that we have on our online collections database. And there you have the caption information, again, after Michelangelo, the most famous sculptor of the Italian Renaissance. The original marble sculpture was created between 14, 1504 to 5. And as I mentioned, it is in the Museo Nazionale del Bargello in Florence, best known as the um, home of Donatello's uh, bronze David but has many other fantastic art objects in it as well. And it was the gift to our museum from the Slater Memorial Museum, and it entered our collection in 2019. Uh, if you are not familiar with the Slater Museum, this is at Norwich Free Academy in Norwich, Connecticut. They have one of the most extraordinary collections of plaster casts really anywhere in the United States, perhaps the world, but I'm not qualified, I think, to say on that regard. And they, I think they're still currently closed for a massive multi-year renovation. But when they reopen, if you have not been there, I cannot strongly encourage you enough to make the drive to Norwich and visit. They have um, plaster casts that were created in the late 19th century and assembled into an incredible collection. Ancient Rome, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, the Italian Renaissance. The first time I visited there, I remembered seeing a cast of Michelangelo's statue of Moses that forms part of the Two monument for Julius II. It's in a church in Rome called San Pietro in Vincoli. You might know it if you think of it's the one where Moses has little horns. And they had it positioned in front of a set of stained glass windows. So the light breaking in around it was just truly remarkable. And is, does not match the viewing experience of seeing the sculpture as it is installed in Rome, where it's on the side of a church surrounded by other marble. Uh, so if you're interested in plaster casts, uh, I definitely recommend a visit to the Norwich Free Academy. 
But as I was saying, it is interesting to see how any art object, whether it is a painting or a sculpture or a cast made after a sculpture, it really changes depending on the circumstances in which you encounter it. Those of you who have attended any of our events about the Crest Show writ large and have heard me mention that the paintings that are part of Fairfield's Crest Collection, they were on campus when I was an undergraduate student, but they there was no museum on campus at the time, and they were stored in a very closet-like room in the library, into which I know I was brought as a first-year student, but I have really no recollection of them. They were not positioned in the way that they are in an art museum, where there's a real sort of intentionality to the environment, the lighting, the even something as basic as the colors on the wall. So in looking at the object that we have in our reference photo, which reflects how it appears in the Egan School of Nursing in its normal environment, versus this photograph that I snapped with my phone this morning of the cast installed in the Cress exhibition, which again will close on Saturday. So it's going to leave this environment. As always in our Art and Focus virtual events, you're more than welcome to drop any observations that you have into the chat as we're going along so we can make this a conversation. But I was in there um, briefly with one of our one of visitors earlier this morning and just thinking about the difference that the green color of the walls of the Crest exhibition makes in really bringing out and making sort of a warm tone of this plaster cast and also just the lighting. Not only um, the warmth of the lighting, but the way that in our gallery, we have the ability to sort of direct the light in an intentional manner that is not something that's possible in a classroom setting because that's simply not what it's for. So I feel that we've been very privileged, even though this is an object that is in the museum collection since it doesn't live with us full time. It's been such a pleasure to have it in the galleries in this context to be able to appreciate it anew, let's say. And anew is kind of a strange word to use for a plaster cast of a 16th century marble sculpture, isn't it? As you may know, Fairfield is home to a collection of historic plaster casts numbering more than 100, most of which are more than a century old. If you visited our Bellarmine Hall galleries, you've probably walked past many of our casts from the of, of the Parthenon sculpture that are in our hallway, um, many of which are on long-term loan from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, from the Yale University Art Gallery, and others have been generous gifts to Fairfield. This is one, as we mentioned, from the Slater Museum. And what's interesting is that the Slater has or had two um, examples of plaster casts of the same sculpture. And they deaccessioned one, meaning they took it out of their collection and made a gift of it to us. I mean, they didn't need two of the same. One of theirs is probably much older and was probably um, acquired in the late 19th century. Whereas the one that they gave to us is probably that there's no clear documentation um, from at least the early 20th century. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But one of the, I would say the challenges, the fascination, the frustration perhaps of plaster casts is that it is very tempting to only look at it and read through it um, to the original object because they are of course reproductions. We're careful to tell people walking into our crest show we do have an autograph El Greco painting, but we do not have an autograph Michelangelo sculpture hanging on the wall. You can be guaranteed that we would have a lot more security in there if this was the real sculpture. But it is always important to remember that a plaster cast is an object of its own. It has had its own life, its own biography. Um, ours is in wonderful shape, but many plaster casts have had you know, their own changes or damage over time. I do know that the the plaster cast that remains in the Slater's collection had a darker patina, a surface coating that was applied to it, where ours is sort of the pure color of plaster. And even the marble original can change color depending on when it was last cleaned or in what light it has been seen. But what are we, we looking at? If we give in to the desire to look through this to the original to see Michelangelo's sculpture, I'll show you, oops, I put the detail. Oh. Oh depending on the order in which I put my slides, kind of shapes the order in which I might say something, right? So let's just talk about what we're seeing in front of us before we see Michelangelo's original. Our show, the Out of the Crest Vault, Women in Sacred Renaissance Painting, had focused on images of women in religious art from the Renaissance. So it is no surprise that many, though not all of the paintings, include the Virgin Mary. And this was one of uh, this plaster cast, although not a painting, formed part of a subset uh, within the show of paintings and objects that were in the tondo format, T-O-N-D-O, 
an Italian word that just means round. What's interesting about Michelangelo's Pititondo, and I'm going to go back here to, hold on, the sort of sideways view. No, well, let's go back one more. The sideways view that you see there on the left, I think helps you see that Michelangelo did not design a perfectly circular composition because the head of the Virgin Mary is just breaking the top of the circumference just gently. So he's playing around with a sculptural and painterly form, the tondo form, that had become very popular in Florence, in particular in the 15th century. And there has been a great deal um, written and spoken on the subject of the tondo. In fact, we had a speaker earlier this semester, Kim Butler Wingfield, whose lecture is available on our YouTube page. And she spoke um, about this form. It was something, especially in the sculpted version that we're looking at here, it emerged out of the Renaissance fascination with all things from the ancient world and found its origin point in small round portrait busts that appeared as part of the decoration of ancient Roman sarcophagi. So these were tombs, uh, very elaborately carved often that would be punctuated the decoration with little round sort of shields on which you would often see an image of the deceased. And that was one of the many aspects of ancient art that Renaissance artists are sort of mining for visual ideas. But it was very helpful that the round circle, this most perfect of geometric shapes that has no beginning and no end, that had rich philosophical connotations relating to the celestial spheres, to God, to the divine, it mapped very, um, I wouldn't say neatly, because Michelangelo is not making it neat, but the circular form mapped very well onto Christian iconography as well. So the circle, the that which is without beginning or end, it became a form that was almost exclusively used for representations of the Virgin Mary with the infant Jesus, as we're seeing here. There is little St. John the Baptist peering out. And although I don't have a photograph that shows this installation um, shot in our gallery, the plaster cast is flanking one side of the archway going into our back galleries. And on the other side of the doorway is a painted tondo by another Florentine artist whose name was Andrea del Sarto. And it's the same three figures. It's the Virgin Mary, the infant Jesus, John the Baptist. This became for some reason a Florentine trend, meaning it was very popular in Florence, in Tuscany. It was also popular in Siena, so other areas in Tuscany, but it really didn't catch on so much in uh, Rome, let's say, or in Venice. The circular format is really sort of indelibly linked to Florence and its sphere of influence. So Michelangelo, in sculpting this tondo, is working in something that other artists have been doing. He doesn't invent the round sculptural form. Um, in fact, there was another plaster cast art and focus that we did last year that was on a 15th century artist. Some of you might remember the Benedetto da Maiano that was originally installed over a tomb in um, a town in Italy. This one instead was created for a particular uh, family of patrons, the Pitti family. So those of you who have traveled to Florence may not only have seen this object in the Bargello, but you might also have visited, for example, Palazzo Pitti, which was purchased from that family by Eleonora di Toledo, the wife of the first Duke, uh, well, really the second, but Cosimo de' Medici, Duke of Florence, who was the great uh, Medici residence, but still bears the name of this proud and wealthy um, family of Florentines. Michelangelo created this object for a member of that family. What is interesting though, is that, well, two things. One is that Michelangelo only ever made two examples of the round tondo sculpted format. He generally either worked in the round three-dimensionally or he worked in more sort of square relief formats. And the other thing that is interesting but not unique in Michelangelo's work is that the object is not finished. So I had this detail there, this is showing right by Mary's sleeve, and the edges of the tondo that are underneath John the Baptist. And it's really most evident in these sort of parallel driving marks that are showing you the effect of Michelangelo's chisel, but really very roughly. It is not brought to a high level of finish or a high level of polish. You can also see some of that coarseness in uh, the sleeve of the Virgin Mary that we're seeing there. For unknown reasons, Michelangelo did not finish the Piti tondo, but he did deliver it to the patron and they proudly kept it and hung on to it. And as we said, is now in Florence's National Museum of the Bargello. 
this actually wound up being a bit of a through line in Michelangelo's career. Um, sometimes it's been estimated that up to one third of his sculptures were not completed for a whole variety of reasons. Some of them he wound into, he wound up finding a flaw in the marble, a, let's say an unsightly vein that is revealed of the material itself that ruined the marble for him. Um, in other cases, the commission, the money ran out. In this case, it seems that he was making it for someone who had been a supporter, but he didn't finish it. And sometimes it's been pointed out that in around the same time, he is working on his great statue of David, that 13 foot tall, extraordinary sculpture in the round that today I think is the iconic image of sculpture in the Italian Renaissance. If Mona Lisa is the Renaissance in painting, Michelangelo's David is certainly the Renaissance epitomized in sculpture. This comes from around the same period. And scholars have wondered if perhaps the sculptor was distracted by this much more grandiose public civic commission. But the answer is we really don't know. But it's interesting in a cast like this to be able to see that um, that evidence of facture, the evidence of the making is there so prominently, except for where it's not. So as I, I said before, it is tempting with plaster casts to go from the object in front of us to look through it to the original. But generally in working with especially historic plaster casts, we want to appreciate them as their own physical object, as their own um, object that is deserving of careful study and careful investigation. And this one, while not as old probably as other historic plaster casts in our collection, is probably, um, let's say, a little under a century old, maybe at a guess. Like I said, we really don't have any firm, um, any firm dating on it. It was made by the Caproni Studio in Boston, who are known for since the late 19th century, having an extraordinary collection of molds of Italian Renaissance sculpture and other objects. So plaster casts in the 19th century were made by um, slathering effectively the original object in plaster to make a negative hollow mold into which fresh plaster could be poured. And the resulting object would pick up ideally the most minute level of details from the original. Larger objects, especially three-dimensional objects were always cast in pieces. And then the plaster was reassembled into the final object. Uh, this one appears to have been cast in a, from a single mold. And today, if this was being done, they would be using sort of very flexible latex, but late 19th century, they are using plaster. But if we go to the Bargello, uh, jumping across the Atlantic, this is the Sala Michelangelo, the Michelangelo room in the Bargello. Dead ahead, we're looking at a sculpture that is known as the, the young Bacchus or the drunken Bacchus made by a young Michelangelo. Uh, the much later, I should say the later 16th century sculptor, John Bologna, his Mercury in bronze is at the right. But if you look toward the left on a gray uh, short wall, you will see the Pitti Tondo, the marble sculpture from the 1503-1504 date. One of the things that I find interesting, this room has been, um, the Bargello has undergone like many Florentine museums, a lot of um, sort of renewal and restructuring. This layout is, is fairly recent. Uh, what I find interesting is the placement of this object all the way over to the left, where the wall so clearly intersects. You can no longer stand to the left of the Virgin Mary from our perspective. You can't meet her gaze. And I would, be, I would love, you know, in a perfect world to discuss with the curators and the exhibition designers on, you know, what the set of choices were. And I'm sure there are many factors being taken into account that I'm not even thinking of relative to the other objects they needed to fit into this room. But one of the things that it's been interesting to stand in front of our plaster cast and know that I can't go to Florence and stand in the same off to the left position in front of the actual object because of how it is installed currently. And in some ways that reflects well, I think, to the content of the object. I'm gonna go back for a second before I continue my previous thought. This, this photograph I did take from kind of off at the left, almost as if I'm meeting the Virgin Mary's gaze. Going back here. If you stand dead on to this object, whether the cast or the original marble, you see that Mary's not making eye contact with us. And that is a common theme in a lot of the objects in our um, exhibition and other images of the Virgin Mary. We, the audience, are not the focus, right? Something is happening before us, but it is not communicating directly to us. And what is it that we're seeing? We see the Virgin Mary 
we see that she's seated. We can make out um, many of the folds of her drapery. We can see her knee. She looks like she's seated on this um, block, this sort of square block of stone that is jutting out from the surface of the relief. We see that her head has an elaborate headdress wrapped around it, although we can make out the waves of her hair flank, um, flanking her face. It is a little bit difficult to th see, I think, in this image, but yes, you might be able to make out that there is a diadem on her head. And the diadem is meant to be a cherub, so a little face with wings. But here we have the first indication, perhaps, that our plaster cast is not picking up the most perfect, minute details of the original because the cherub in her headdress is actually quite hard to distinguish. It's not easy in the original sculpture by any means, but it's a little bit easier to read than it is in this plaster cast. So Mary has her gaze averted from us, the viewer. She has a book that's open. And where is the infant Jesus? He's leaning his whole body and arm onto her book. He's standing actually in a very sort of classic contrapposto pose, one of his legs bent, one of his legs engaged. You might be able to just make out that his mother has her hand, her left hand, curled gently around his side. His other hand is sort of hanging by his side. And he certainly looks to me like he's smiling, right? So if we just look at the part with the baby, this speaks to me of a kid who's interrupting his mom's reading. Or she's not paying attention to him, so he's going to bodily insert him into what she's himself into what she's doing to make sure that attention goes where the baby wants it. But Mary is not looking at her son right? She's looking off into the distance. She's not looking at us or him. She's not taking any um, acknowledgement of John the Baptist, who's just sort of coming faintly out of the flat surface of the relief behind her. And this has been interpreted in a variety of ways. And if you visited our press exhibition or gone on the website or read any of our materials, you may know that there are very common depictions of Mary in um, a form of melancholy in a lot of images from this time period. There was a popular understanding that Mary had some sort of divine foreknowledge of the fate that her son would undergo, of the fact that he would be crucified for the sins of mankind in the Christian narrative. So she often looks sad instead of, as we might expect her, to be a joyful or playful young mother. So that's one element of the interpretation that has gone into this. And what I mentioned previously, the fact that her, her headdress um, has a cherub, an angel on the diadem has occasionally been interpreted by art historians, um, angels and prophecy. So the connection being Mary as carrier of divine foreknowledge and the addition of a cherub to her headdress being Michelangelo signaling that that's something that he's thinking about in designing the object. And then another question we can ask is what's in the book? We can interpret the book as a book of Psalms. Um, that was a common interpretation of Mary can be seen reading. And in fact, is seen also reading a book in the painting that is nearby borrowed from the Crest Foundation in which uh, Mary's reading and little St. John the Baptist and Jesus are behind her. So she's frequently shown reading um, in depictions and it's understood that she's reading some form of religious text. It could be the Psalms. It could be understood in some ways as a book of prophecy in its own right. And she's been distracted by it or distracted from it, I should say, but less so perhaps from the rambunctious child who's getting in her way than by sort of the weighty content of what it is she's reading or thinking about. It seems to be that she is weighed down in a certain sense. And weighed down and also oddly constrained. If we think about this being a, you know, um, I was about to say a full-size woman, but let's say just an average size woman. Let's say she's 5'4". She certainly looks a little bit squeezed into this round frame. I'm not sure that I can actually believe, for example, that her torso has adequate room beneath her neck to really have her torso, her waist. We do see the long jut of um, her thigh coming out there. When you really start to think about her proportions, it doesn't seem quite to fit. And indeed, it seems that Michelangelo um, has had her head breaking the circumference of the art object as if Mary can't be constrained by this round form that is so popular. So going back to what I was about to show you in the Bargello, and there's again, looking closely at Mary's face, the surface of the object in our um, example, let's go back to the Bargello and let's get much closer. Uh, this is their reference photo. Uh, and this I think was pre-cleaning. So you might notice going back just one slide, 
the surface color of the stone does seem quite close to white. Um, this is Carrera marble, Michelangelo's preferred. I think this photograph on the left was taken a, a years ago, and I think it was prior to the sculpture being cleaned. You can find very interesting videos on YouTube of how conservators clean marble sculpture. Uh, there's an excellent one from, I believe it's the MFA in Boston, and they're using basically a laser. And it's kind of the same kind of laser you use for tattoo removal, but it is effectively lasering off any dirt without affecting any of the work of the sculptor. I mean, it's really fascinating to look into how they are carefully cleaning and conserving um, these sculptures. And I know that the New York Times within the last couple of weeks also ran an article talking to the conservator whose responsibility it is for dusting and cleaning Michelangelo's David. So if you have not read that article, I encourage you to go to the New York Times and look that up because that was pretty cool. Gets cleaned four times a year. But the detail that I'd like to look at is this close-up of Mary's face. So I think you can see from both the image on the left and the detail that the cherub on Mary's headdress is a little bit easier to read as having wings coming out from its head than it is in ours. It's not well-defined, but what really becomes evident on her face is the tool marks. We are seeing lots more evidence of Michelangelo's chisel. And I think it's much easier to see this object as unfinished in this kind of photograph than it is in our cast object. And what does that mean? I mean, for the object itself in the Bargello, again, it is fascinating to know that you are looking at the direct evidence of sort of a four clawed chisel or a three clawed chisel being used for some of the final details and knowing that this would have all been erased by a rasp, so a device used for polishing the surface to a very high finish. Um, areas of the robe seem to have been polished to a higher finish, but Certainly, if you look at Michelangelo's David, you're not going to see any of these kind of tool marks. That was brought to a very high level of finish and polish. So it is incredible to be able to have this sort of immediacy of evidence of the sculptor's hand in the object that's in Florence. In ours, however, it appears that the um, some of that level of lack of finish has been a little bit smoothed out in the cast making process. One thing that had occurred to me today that would be really interesting for me to see, if you could compare lots of different examples of plaster casts of this object, the molds of which were taken in the 19th century directly from the thing itself. It would be interesting to see, has there been any change in the mold? Um, or what, is what we're seeing here a reflection of the production process? Was there a conscious decision at some point to lightly smooth away the evidence of that tool work to create a more finished final product? I don't have answers to those questions. They're just things that I wondered in looking closely at this object in the show. And as I said, it has been such a pleasure this semester to have this in our galleries, to be looking at it regularly. And while I'm sure the nursing school will be happy to have it back, we in the museum will be sad to see it go. If anyone has any questions or observations of their own, they're more than welcome to drop them into the chat. Um, while we're waiting to see if anyone does have any of those, I'll just remind you that you can visit www.fairfield.edu slash museum slash Crest Vaults. I know it's a long title. I'll repeat it. Fairfield.edu slash museum slash Crest Vaults. For those of you who have not experienced the show and can't come here in person, we have a virtual tour of the exhibition. We have a two-minute sort of video overview that will sort of swing you through the highlights. You can download a copy of the catalog. Um, and you can also go to our YouTube YouTube page and watch all of the programs that we've had this semester. So we've been really fortunate to have some fantastic uh, scholars speaking, including Diane Modestini, the conservator. I mentioned Kim Butler Wingfield. We also had Jackie Mazzaccio from, excuse me, Mazzaccio from Wellesley talking about um, art at home in Renaissance Italy. So those videos are there for you as well to experience more of the show. And if you do have any questions or observations, or if anyone has a plaster cast of this at home and wants to um, bring it to us for a comparison, just feel free to send us an email and we would love to know. Uh, Marion had a question, are plaster casts ever painted if the original was painted? That is a great question. I mentioned the word patina earlier, which refers to a sort of a surface coating. If you visit our plaster cast gallery, for example, you will find that some of the historic plaster casts were given um, a patina that's just a faint coloring, let's say like a pale brown or a tan that was intended um, to give them more of an aged look. And that has become part of their history. It is not going to be removed. Others like the one that we have here 
we're never given any sort of surface coating and you're just seeing the sort of pure color of the plaster. The marble objects of the Renaissance were not typically painted. They did have polychrome sculpture. Uh, for example, when they sculpted in wood, the wood was typically painted. Uh, you also have a beautiful examples of glazed terracotta where the terracotta was um, colored in usually sort of slightly more pastel shades. But Michelangelo never painted any of his sculptures. In fact, he was so invested in the very pure white color of Carrera marble that he was very famous for going to the marble quarries and picking out the blocks himself. And he was famous for being able to kind of assess whether there was likely to be a flaw inside. I mentioned that often he did find out there were flaws once he started carving, but he had pretty good luck in identifying really good blocks of stone. Um, this is a common question about the painting of sculpture because as some of you may know, the marble and stone sculptures of the ancient world, which was of course the time period that sculptors like Michelangelo admired and wanted to draw from, little did Renaissance artists know that the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans did paint their sculptures. It's just that when those sculptures survived to be excavated in the Renaissance, the paint was gone or had been reduced to such minimal amounts that it was not really visible on the surface. We can now test it in a laboratory and see that there are pigments there. So this is a whole um, subfield of classical archeology span and art history, reconstructing what those ancient objects look like. Sometimes they are very jarring to our modern eyes because they might be, for example, you know, primary colors intended to make an object very readable, such as the sculptures on the Parthenon. But the objects that the Renaissance um, sculptors were seeing had no color and they imitated that in their marble sculpture. They did not apply color to it. So it's a, it's a fascinating question um, and one that I thank you, Marianne, for asking because it's very cool. And I sh should mention that Dr. Catherine Schwab, who is the professor of art history who focuses on Greek sculpture and specifically on the um, sculpture decorating the Parthenon, if you visit our galleries, she has some of her reconstruction drawings are in the hallway. So she works on reconstructing some of the metopes, which are square relief panels from the Greek uh, Parthenon in, um, in Athens. And she is also working on developing these sort of color mock-ups. So giving a sense of what these objects would have looked like when they were complete, then also painted. So we have so far one example in the hallway where we have her drawings of the finished sculpture and then one of her renditions of what it would look like painted. So the next time you come to the galleries, you'll have to check that out in the hallway to get a sense of what the original Greek sculpture might have looked like. I don't think we have any other questions. So I wanna thank everyone for joining me virtually today and we will look forward to seeing you in the spring. You can drop by our main website, fairfield.edu slash museum, click on programs and you can check out all of our upcoming programs for spring 2023. Have a happy holiday season and we will see you in the new year.